Welcome to EPL's Freedom to Read Week's celebration with author Lawrence Hill. My name is Emily. I'm a librarian with the Edmonton Public Library. Freedom to Read Week is celebrated every year during the last week of February. It's a time when we're encouraged to reflect on intellectual freedom, but upholding the community's right to read is a year round responsibility at libraries. Books are challenged and even banned in Canada and around the world. So I'm joined by internationally acclaimed author, Lawrence Hill, and we're going to talk about some of his favorite banned books. Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you for welcoming me, Emily. I really appreciate it. It's delightful to be here and to join you to celebrate freedom to read and, of course, freedom to write. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for joining me. Um, before we get into some of your favorite books that have been challenged or banned, I wanted to ask you about your writing being challenged. The title of your book, The Book of Negroes, created some controversy, and it led you to write an essay, which I actually have with me right now. Dear sir, I intend to burn your book. So can you tell us a bit about the situation and what led you to write this essay? Well, The Book of Negroes was published in Canada in 2007. Then it started appearing around the world, you know, in subsequent years. Um, I don't use the word Negroes in ordinary speech. Uh, let's remember it is not the N word by any means. That is a totally different word. And the word Negroes appears in the title of the novel because it resurrects a forgotten history that's embedded in a historical document that the British Navy kept in 1783. And that document was called the Book of Negroes. And it's a, it's a register of 3,000 Black people who are fleeing New York City at the end of the Revolutionary War and coming to settle in primarily in Nova Scotia, Canada, as the Black Loyalists of Nova Scotia. So it's, a, it's an incredibly significant historical document that allows us to track the movements of the first major wave of Black people in Canada and their connections with Africa, the United States, uh, Europe, and, uh, and, and of course, Canada. And so that's why I titled the book, The Book of Negroes, because I was bringing to public attention this forgotten history uh, in that document, that ledger is very much part of the novel. It was celebrated in Canada. I went on tour in the Netherlands with the book. I met with many black communities in the Netherlands while I was on tour with the book. Uh, bizarrely, the two countries in the world where my book has done the best outside of, uh, say, Canada and the United States are the Netherlands and uh, Norway. <laughs> so I was on tour in the Netherlands and meeting with many Black communities. And of course, the Netherlands has its own slave history, which is a slave trading nation, a slaving nation, and, um, and had uh, slave colonies. Um, and so a gentleman uh, was very offended by the title of the book. He wrote me an email with the line, there's beginning with this hilarious and bizarre line, dear sir, I intend to burn your book, and proceeded to burn copies of the cover of the book while television cameras rolled in a public park in Amsterdam. My publisher's life was threatened. Um, I received many hateful emails. Uh, the thing about banning books and burning books is that um, it really puts fear in people's hearts and people get nervous, publishers, bookstores, distributors, schools. If there's any controversy, a controversy associated with a book, even if the book's highly defendable and an important book, then many people just get scared off because they worry about being engaged in controversy. So some people imagine that, that a controversy like that will be good for the author because it brings good publicity to the author. Once in a blue moon that happens, it's kind of like winning the 649, but most times it scares people away from the book. Schools, libraries, bookstores, publishers, they all back away because they're terrified of controversy. And it, 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 it's dis absolutely destructive for readers and, and for writers. Um, and so that's what happened to me. And I wrote the essay to engage in a public conversation with this person who would not engage with conversation with me. You know that somebody burning a book is not too interested in, in a civilized conversation. And I tried to engage, but he wasn't interested. You know, book burning is an awful thing. And it, it's often, uh, uh, it often precedes um, genocide, uh, murder. Um, this did not happen in my case, but if you think about the Spanish Inquisition, the Holocaust uh, and other blights on, on humanity, often book burning uh, preceded, you know, the, 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 the murdering 
of, of people. Um, and it's, it's not a, a tool that people use if they want to have a peaceful and civilized disagreement you know, about literature, which I'm always open for. So that's what happened to me. And I wrote the, the short essay, Dear Sir, I intend to burn your book, to engage with this person and to engage with the ideas that he represented you know, in a public dialogue and to oppose them vociferously, but peacefully. <laughs> Something that you said really resonated with me. Well, a lot of it, but um, it's funny. Like it, it's a funny situation. It's a funny thing because of how ridiculous it is, but it's also not funny because we have this historical context of, of how books have been burned, as you mentioned, and of the real consequences of these challenges and these bannings. And that's something as I've been doing more research into Freedom to Read Week, I can't help but laugh and then feel that twinge and that cringe of the real world consequences of these situations. Yes, and my feeling is that like, it is a good thing that people disagree vociferously about literature, just like it's a good thing that we disagree about politics, have different political parties, have different political options, have different forms of art that we love, uh, different forms of social and political organization that we adhere to. Those are all good things. Those are all hallmarks of, hallmarks of democracy to disagree about the things that we care for and treasure in society. But to burn books and to ban them, um, to pull them from bookshelves. That's not uh, the opening of dialogue, that's a closing of dialogue. That, that inhibits conversation when that's what we need most to understand each other and then move forward. So there are many books that I detest too. There are many racist, misogynistic, offensive books that I think are reprehensible. And I like to remind myself and, and children that books are just a person talking. And so you may really be offended by the way that person talks and you have every right to disagree as I frequently have, you know, with the way certain people talk in their books. A book is a person talking and so you don't have to agree with it. Uh, it's good to disagree if that's, if that's what you need to do. But the question is, where do you take that disagreement? And is, mm -hmm. it, to the, is it to the advancement of society and civilization and freedom and, and, and peace, you know, that we ban books or pull them from bookshelves, which I think is based on a very um, hubristic and um, superior and condescending attitude that I can manage this book. I know what's wrong with this book and I know how to shelve it in my life to make sense of it or to contextualize it where I need, but other people don't know. So I'm gonna decide for them because they don't know although I do. So I'm gonna protect other people who can't possibly use their own minds the way I can. And I'm gonna protect them from the ideas that are embedded in this book because they won't know what to do with them, but I do. So I'm just gonna be big granddaddy and take this out of their hands and not let them see it because we're not having that discussion and that's that. Well, that is a horrendous way to lead a society or to participate in conversation. So I welcome disagreement and debate and I think that it's vital, but to censor even a book that I hate Mein Kampf by Hitler, in my opinion, should not be burned or banned because some scholar who's maybe going to be born tomorrow, but it's going to turn into the next world expert about genocide, might need to read Mein Kampf by Hitler in order to understand the seeds of racial hatred and genocide. Somebody might need to read that book in order to develop um, compassionate and humanistic approaches to understanding and, and, and preventing you know, genocide in the future. So uh, even maybe one of the most hateful books in history should not, in my opinion, be burned or banned. It should just be let to sit on a, on a shelf and, and, and let the readers who need to come to it, you know, come to it and let them decide what to make of it. Absolutely. We always say there should be something to offend everyone in the, <laughs> in the library. I know we could talk a lot more about that, but uh, I encourage everyone to check out Dear Sir, I Intend to Burn Your Book to learn more about that situation. But I want to jump into some of your favorite banned books. So what is your first pick for us? Well, there's so many, but I'm going to start with Another Country by James Baldwin. James Baldwin was an African-American writer born in the early 20th century, it becomes extremely famous as an essayist and novelist. Another Country was one of his early novels, I think 1962. Um, the Fire Next Time is one of his most famous essays. It's been quoted and reread and admired 
uh, for many generations, you know, by many people. And I tucked into Baldwin and other black writers when I was about 14 and started reading adult literature because he and many other black writers were on my parents' bookshelf. So I just started to inhale all the famous African-American literature of the 50s, 60s, 70s, when I was growing up, you know, in the early 60s in Toronto. And so um, another country is a novel that celebrates love, uh, queer love. Um, uh, it celebrates bisexuality uh, and homosexuality. And it, uh, it, it, it's written at the very powerful, majestically poetic hands of James Baldwin. Naturally, you know, like as there is in many books, mine too, occasionally, there's some things that are a little crude or a little bit graphic, but sometimes we need to go there as artists to get across the points in the drama that we wish to establish on the page. Not everything in literature or in art is meant to be polite and, 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 and sort of showable to the queen. You know, uh, many things we do, what we just need to do because this is the world we're trying to represent. So it's a, it's a book that was uh, appalling to the government of Australia that, that banned it from entry into Australia and was appalling to many others too who, who attempted to censor it. And so that would be one of my first examples because James Baldwin, well, I won't say universally, but is widely admired as one of the most significant writers and thinkers of the 20th century period in English and, and uh, one of the most famous and admired and beloved writers in the world. And so that his book should be banned by the government of Australia and by many others as well is just an indication of how um, rooted this, this desire to ban literature is embedded in, in our societies. So that would be one of my first picks. It was interesting to me to see in excerpts from Australia's uh, censorship decision that they said, um, this is not appropriate for Australians. It makes me think of what you were <laughs> talking about with the, the granddaddies. We, we've decided maybe other people can handle this, but not for our people. We've made that decision. And to be Absolutely. outright banned from an entire country is just such a sweeping decision to make for such a large amount of people. Yes, and Canada has often held up or banned books at the border too. I want to be absolutely clear about that. Yeah. I don't want to point fingers at Australia and make us think that this is not a Canadian thing too. We have banned gay literature. We have banned and held up and prevented, prevented from entering the country all sorts of literatures in the past. So we too have, have carried out these offensive and censorship processes, not just Australia. And I do want to be clear about that. Yes, absolutely. And uh, along with, of course, all of James, James Baldwin's work, I would highly recommend a documentary that we have available through the library about James Baldwin. That is uh, really excellent if you want to learn more about him and his civil rights work. It's almost a pity to have this conversation. I love having it, but almost a pity because we could talk about a thousand books and absolutely. we're only selecting a few. But this is another great example, Foxfire by the American novelist Joyce Carol Oates. There probably are not many living writers in North America who have published more books than Joyce Carol Oates. She's world famous. She's uh, read in, in high schools and universities around the world. Um, she's been publishing for decades. I don't know even how many books she's written, but there are a few writers who have written more books than Joyce Carol Oates who are alive this day. Uh, and Foxfire is a novel set in the 1950s in Upper New York State, and it's about a girl gang. These are girls who have been abused. They have been violently abused, uh, sexually and in other ways abused by men. And uh, they decide to form a gang to fight back and to, and to exact retribution and to start to punish their offenders. And, and of course, once this girl gang gets going, they have a certain momentum and they they actually end up carrying out crimes, you know, that are even in excess of the things that they have been subjected to in terms of the level of violence that they meet out. So they really get some you know, violent momentum going in this girl gang. And the novel is really a warning about the dangers of gang life and about how a gang life can suck a person into violence, even though the impetus to form a gang and maybe strike back is understandable. It comes from a human place. The danger of, of living in a gang is that you sort of lose sight of your moral compass and end up engaging sometimes in absolutely heinous, 
behavior. So read at its deepest level, read by any thoughtful reader who actually cares about the messages of the book, the book is a warning, a clear unequivocal moral warning about the dangers of violence that, that are kind of exacerbated by participating in gang life. So in my view, the book is a highly moral, uh, thoughtful uh, novel that examines an important issue Kids are being drawn into gangs all the time. And sometimes as a result, they lose their health, they lose their lives, other people die. So it's a big issue in North America and in the world. And But the novel features a gang of girls who've been abused, who are rough, intrude. They swear a lot. The, every swear word you could imagine promenades on the page, sometimes in quite funny ways. The girls use very inventive and playful cuss words. By the way, Eden Robinson, uh, the, the, the First Nations writer in Canada is terrifically um, inventive with her swear words too in the novel Son of a Trickster. It's got some of the most hilarious swear words I've ever found in <laughs> Son of a Trickster. But, but coming back to Joyce Carol Oates, uh, the girls swear a lot because they're in a gang and that's how they're living. So you imagine a bad word, it's in the book. And so a group of parents called uh, Halton Parents Against Corrupt Teachers rose up to argue that this book should not be taught in high schools in, in Milton, Ontario, a small town in Ontario, north of Toronto, uh, because it, um, it had so many swear words in it. And the, this pact, this Parents Against Corrupt Teachers group, ridiculous name if I ever heard one, um, uh, actually listed all the swear words on the book. On page one, here are the swear words. On page two, here are the swear words. They developed like a 27 or whatever page list of all the swear words in the book as an argument to support their contention that the book should not be read by high school students. And um, this caused fear and panic and the book was indeed reduced in its access to, to students as a result of this protest. And that is frankly ridiculous, first of all, do you not think that 99.9% .9 of high school students in that school would have known those words already, would have heard them a hundred times and probably knew a lot of other words that weren't in the book? Come on, like, are these words going to damage a soul? No, not if you read the book thoughtfully. Uh, the, the, it, and there's so much benefit to, to an analysis of gang life and its dangers that the, that the children in school are being deprived of when they're basically having the book removed from their reach because some parents think that there are too many cuss words in it. So that would be another example of, of, of an overreach in, in, a, in an idea that I as a parent know what you as a 17 year old can handle and what you cannot. And I'm gonna decide for you what you're allowed to read in school. No, thank you, uh, really. This is not a way to get children talking and thinking and experimenting. And if you think for a minute that you're actually protecting your children from cuss words by denying them access to a book in high school, your eyes are shut because you don't know what they're listening to on the radio or on Spotify or what, you, what they're watching on TV and movies. And if you think you're protecting them from anything that they're not already fully aware of, you're like living in a, in a dream world. And, and it's offensive because it reduces access to literature and tells the world, hey, we get to choose what children get to read and what they don't. Yeah, it is this delusional sense of control that I think a lot of people are going after. And um, I found a bit of an Edmonton Public Library connection with Joyce Carol Oates. It was not this work, but one of her, um, she was featured in an essay collection called Deadly Sins. And um, a customer at Edmonton Public Library asked us to remove it from our collection because they said it entices and encourages people to commit the sins listed in the book. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to ban deadly sins, I guess you better ban the Bible because it lists a lot of sins. <laughs> okay, maybe, very good maybe, point. maybe maybe it too will encourage people to do the things that they're not supposed to do. Yeah, there are a lot of sins mentioned in the Bible, and some of them are quite graphic. And the Bible has been one of the most challenged books uh, throughout <laughs> history as well, so it all fits together. Um, so your third and last pick for your favorite band book, or some of your favorite band books. So what I've tried to do, since there are so many, unfortunately, books that have been banned and challenged, is to pick a variety of books that have been banned for different reasons. So um, the... Uh, Issues of, 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 of sex and, and, uh, and, and queer life and race in James Baldwin 
the issues of, of language and, 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 and swear words and, and the, crudity of, the crudeness of language in, in Joyce Carol Oates. And this comes down now to issues of religion and intentions in the Middle East. And I'm gonna talk about three wishes Palestinian and Israeli children speak by the wonderful and worldwide celebrated children's writer, Deborah Ellis, an Ontario-based writer. I read Three Wishes, uh, Palestinian and Israeli children speak, as did my young daughter, Evangeline, who's now 26, but who was about nine when she read this book and when protests first erupted. When Evangeline was about nine, she was devouring literature, one of those kids that just read everything and inhaled books, like several a day, like entire books. She, she probably read more books by the time she was 12 than I would read in my lifetime. Honestly, I just can't believe how many books that girl read when she was young. And one of them was Three Wishes and Deborah Ellis for a while was her favorite author. Deborah Ellis is not really present as a narrator in Three Wishes. What she did was to go to the Middle East and to interview Palestinian and Israeli children about their lives. What's it like to live in Israel, in the occupied territories, in really what can only be described in many respects as a segregated war zone? Uh, certainly many, many people's lives are, are inhibited and, and restricted to the degree that they would refer to their own lives as being segregated in relation to kind of others living in Israel. And, um, and it just lets these children speak without Deborah Ellis intervening. She asks questions, which are offstage in the book, and then the children just come forward with little monologues. So a number of Israeli and, and Palestinian children speak. It's a deeply moving book because we hear children speaking with their own values and in their own words, with their own worries about what it's like not to be able to move freely, not to be able to understand the other, not to ever be able to meet and, and a, a Jewish Israeli person say, if you're Palestinian living in the occupied territories or vice versa, not to be able to ever meet and get to know, say a, a, a Palestinian person living in a camp or something, you know, if you happen to be an Israeli citizen living on the other side of the fence, so to speak, not to be able to move freely, go back and forth to, for reasons of social interaction or for work or things like that. Uh, what, what it's like to fear, you know, to, be, to fear violence and what it's like to live with violence. And one of the children in the book talks about the fact that um, I believe it was her sister had become a suicide bomber. Now, honestly, if you read that book with any open heart and with any critical eye, I think it would be impossible to conclude that that book advocates suicide bombing. I think what you would have to conclude with any thoughtful reading of the book is that here is a window into the pain of children's lives. And this child is talking about her pain and the pain of uh, having a sister who is a suicide bomber. There's no advocacy whatsoever for the benefits or merits of suicide bombing in this book. I must say that. But some in the Jewish community were so opposed to this book and so offended by it that they successfully argued that this award-winning book, awarded by children, I should say, in a children's reading series awards organized you know, in Ontario by, by the Ontario Library Association, I believe, uh, even an awarded book awarded by children uh, was, was essentially removed from free access to students in schools in the Toronto District School Board. And so I'm appalled that, that again, we are deciding for children what they are capable of reading and what they are not. And because some of us think that there are dangerous ideas floating around in this book, that therefore we must protect children from it and not let them see these ideas. Again, if you are a child and if you're going to read a book like this, you probably have seen the television, on at some point, you probably have seen news. You've probably heard about suicide bombings. You may well be a child who's fled a war zone, become a refugee and had to leave a, a, a horrific violence in your own homeland and sought shelter in Canada or somewhere else in the world. Um, children experience violence like this every day of the year all over the world, including in Canada. And so to think that we must protect children from the very things that they experience is, is again, condescending and offensive and inhibits human conversation. 
And so any child who's gonna read this book is, has probably seen some movies, probably has seen the TV turned on, may have seen their parents flipping open a newspaper, probably has heard conversations in the schoolyard or in the classroom or on the street about, about troubles in, in, in the Middle East. And I doubt very much that this would be their first exposure to these issues. But if it is, so much the better, because it, 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 we all need to be exposed to the troubles of the world. And this is one of the greatest uh, sources of, 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 of violence and ongoing um, war, you know, that, that the contemporary world has seen. And, and of course, we all care for a peaceful resolution to tensions in the Middle East, peaceful for all people, so we can all live peacefully. And so I, I do believe that this book is profoundly important because it allows children's voices to speak about what it's like to live in a war zone. And who are we to tell children that, that who live these stories, that those same stories cannot be shared with other children. So that's why Three Wishes, Palestinian and Israeli Children by Deborah Ellis is my third pick. And I love that book. It is beautifully written and I celebrate it. Another excellent pick. And we see a lot of challenges uh, and bannings coming for children's books. And you have recently written a children's book, Beatrice and Croc Harry, which is right over your shoulder there. Your first book for young readers, um, with knowing that children's books are often a target for these kinds of challenges, did that cross your mind at all in terms of content and language? Did you have any sort of different approach with this new book? I had a different approach, you know, because I was writing for children. I mean, I hope adults will love it too. I love a lot of children's books and my children, when they were still children, they're not now all adults. They loved a lot of adult books that they were reading when they were children as I was reading adult books when I was still a child. So we read each other's books more than one would imagine. Um, I wasn't worried about, I wasn't thinking about you know, censorship or things like that, because I don't like to think about those things when I write. If I worry about people's reactions, including possible censors, um, it just makes me anxious. And it's hard for me to loosen up and, and just be explosive, you know, volcanic and creative and fully imaginative on the page. I want to be free when I write, free to go to where my imagination wants to take me. So I try to shut out the voices of readers while possible readers, potential future readers, while I'm writing, positive or negative readers, just because I, I don't want to worry about them when I'm writing. Will I worry about them after I'm published? For sure. But I don't want to worry about them while I'm writing because I, I want to be free and uninhibited on the page. But of course, I had to think about how to present, you know, what to me is a deeply serious story about racism, about the loss of racial identity, about the need even from children, by children, to confront and oppose uh, racial injustice, um, uh, black identity, um, the kind of the aftershocks of the transatlantic slave trade and in the way this novel deals without saying these words, this novel explores the aftershocks of the results of the transatlantic slave trade. These are all very serious issues, which I'm presenting to children. So I, I felt I had to find a way to make it palatable and interesting, entertaining and, and uh, kind of appealing to children. And uh, I mean, the one thing that I think is a responsibility as a writer for children is to provide something that uplifts and that um, provides hope and light. You don't want to beat down a child. Of all people, you know, I don't want my book to hurt or beat down a child. I want my book to present a child with hope and laughter and possibilities, even if it presents you know, painful material, which, which mine does. And so I had to think about how to examine the issues that I've been writing about for 30 years in a way that would be appropriate for children. So you know, how much violence, what kind of language, um, uh, how, much, how, sh how much should the violence be graphic and how much should it just be kind of quickly alluded to without going too much into graphic detail, though, and then how to counterbalance the pain in the book with light and laughter and fun and effervescence and playful language. So I did work very hard to find a way to make this book entertaining and interesting for children, while at the same time not shying away from the issues that have, that have been at the front and center of my literary investigations for, for 30 years. So I didn't worry about censors because that's just too much. But I did think a lot about children and 
and my own children. I have five, you know, they're all grown now. And how did I talk to them? Uh, how did I introduce them to painful concepts and still be engaging with them? And could I find a way to be playful, engaging, fun, and also deadly serious, you know, in writing for children? And so I had to think a lot about those things, but I tried not to think about censors. That's fascinating to hear about your process. And uh, it's a beautiful book. We have many copies at the library uh, coming in. So we're excited to share that with everyone in Edmonton. Uh, we could talk about this for so much longer, but I won't <laughs> keep you forever. So I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your favorite band books and for sharing your thoughts with us to celebrate Freedom to Read Week. Thank you so much, Emily. I really appreciate it. It's great to do this. And uh, I'd love to return to the library in person at the first opportunity. We would love that too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care.